All right, so welcome everybody to the workshop on full spectrum solutions. The, the purpose in this workshop is just to go through the basics of sunlight and radiation and light and just all the difference in there because of course that is one of, one of the homeostatic essentials. Uh, you know, it's, it's one of those things that you have to deal with. It's, uh, it's a necessity of life. Um, there's the upside and there's the downside. So we're going to be hitting a little bit of both of those uh, on tonight because we just haven't really covered a lot on that topic. It's just one of those things, you know, hey, get some sunlight and you're fulfilling a, you're, you're fulfilling a need. But there is more to that category than just that. So I want to start with this, uh, with this point. But uh, before we actually go into that, I am going to shamelessly sell you guys a copy of, of my book, The Seven Homeostatic Essentials, The Not-So-Secrets to Feeling Better and Living Longer. Um, but realistically, uh, I don't have to sell you on it because you can get on the website at liberationchiropractic.com and if you go to the right side of the screen, you can simply sign up for the newsletter and you get a copy of it for free in PDF that's not black and white, it's in uh, pretty colors and the whole bit. So. Get on there and download it for free. It's, it's worthwhile. Um, but I want to go specifically to the section on sunlight, which is chapter three, and just read the initial paragraph on it, uh, which is actually the same on the website, but it just kind of gives you a, a, an overall starting point uh, regarding sunlight. So you've been told most of your life that the sun is bad. You've been told sunscreen should be applied generously every time you go out in the sun. You've been told that skin cancer is caused by too much sun and too little sunblock. Unfortunately, these truths are grossly misleading. Sunlight is absolutely critical to your health in ways we still don't fully understand. Like anything, moderation and adaptation must be considered, of course, but sunlight is essential in hormone regulation, sleep cycle regulation, mental state, vitamin D production, gut metabolism, and biodiversity, and, what, and much more. One truth is absolute. If you want to be healthy, you can't avoid sunlight. Let's look at a few common examples of how this plays out. As vitamin D is a crucial activator of the immune system and is produced through exposure to sunlight, when fall comes and the general population begins to spend less and less time in the sun, we see greater levels of vitamin D deficiency. The indirect result of this is what we call the flu season. Influenza, just like any other bacterial virus, is an opportunist. In order to infect the host, it needs to breach the walls of the immune system and vitamin D deficiency ju does just that. Rather than getting a flu shot every year, which more often than not proves worthless, hike up your vitamin D levels through this transition period and you'll be better protected, right? So, you know, that's, and of course that's just one example and the, the chapters in this uh, book are not very long because they're supposed to just teach you the basics, the fundamentals. Um, you know, in, in other words, look at the book as a transition point to understand the seven categories, the seven essentials, then that's what workshops are for, is to f start filling in all the thousands and thousands of gaps that, you know, we could go on with on different topics all the time. So taking that now and transitioning into here, uh, you know, talking about sunlight and talking about light and radiation in general, you really have to understand that all of the above is all part of the electromagnetic spectrum. So when you look here, you see that everything from broadcast to radio to radar, microwaves, infrared, are a little tiny band of what we call visible light, then ultraviolet, x-rays, gamma rays, cosmic rays, they're all part of this huge spectrum, which I'm sure, you know, this doesn't even, this probably isn't even complete. There's probably you know, waves on the other end and waves down here, and there's probably stuff that we still don't quite understand. But, you know, what we see is just a very, very small sliver of the whole thing, but it ultimately is all the same picture. It's all still within the realm of electromagnetics, and it's still, uh, you know, it, it's still just based on wavelengths, okay? We just see different wavelengths throughout the process. So, uh, I, I also want to cover this because this topic is, it's so hard to wrap your head around the idea of radiation and radioactive materials and particle physics as a whole, which is of course the, the, you know, the, the, the big picture behind why there are so few particle physicists and why, you know, why that, that realm just seems so mysterious to most people. Because we have a hard time grasping the difference between particles and, and energy and everything else because of our idea of the difference between energy and matter, right? 
So you think that the chair that you're sitting on is material, right? You know, but if you know anything about quantum physics, you understand that the chair and in fact your butt really aren't matter, right? It's just energy. And there's energy that's holding the tissues together. It's holding it all together so that, you know, when you sit down, you actually keep a separation between the chair and your hind, right? So when you, when you look at this and you put it all into picture, this is probably the best representation so far. This is one of the unifying theories out there. It's called string theory. So in physics, string theory is a theoretical framework in which the point-like particles of particle physics are replaced by one-dimensional objects called strings, which are no more than strings of energy. Okay, it's, it's a smaller unit below particles. You know, you've got the atom, or you, you know, you take molecules and you break it down into atoms, and then you break the atoms into neutrons and electrons and protons, and you break those down into further, you know, quarks and all that. When you break it down to its lowest level, they're basically saying, in theory, they think it's just strings of energy, or that's the way that they want to represent it, because ultimately it's all just energy. So in other words, the whole universe, everything that we see, everything that we know that exists, is all made up of these. It's all just strings. Everything. There's nothing that's material. Everything is just energy. So it describes how these strings propagate through space and interact with each other. What we do know is that, that like I said, even matter isn't matter. It's energy. What you see as matter is not matter. When you, you know, when you punch somebody in the face, you're, you know, it's really just your energy bouncing against their energy. It's not really material, right? So, but it still hurts nonetheless, right? <laughs> uh, so understanding this in terms of radioactivity and radiation is important because otherwise it's hard to distinguish. Your brain just can't really you know, jump back and forth between energy and matter. Like, how is it that radiation affects matter? Why can certain radiation go through matter and others can't, right? What makes an x-ray, a low penetrating x-ray, different from an x-ray that you get that goes all the way through and we take a measurement of your spine? Like, what's the difference? And it just comes down to the wavelength and its ability to pass through material, right? Uh, because ultimately it's just energy squeezing through other energetic fields. Does that make sense? Okay. So what is radiation? And radiation is the emission as electron electromagnetic waves or as moving subatomic particles, especially high energy particles, that cause ionization. Uh, simply put, radiation is energy that comes from a source and travels through some kind of material or through space. So radiation is both natural and man-made. Our bodies are exposed to natural radiation every day, from soil and underground, ga uh, underground gases to cosmic radiation from the sun and outer space. Our own inventions, such as medical devices, telephone, television, cell phones, uh, telephones, what are those, right? <laughs> and uh, microwave ovens, all having different strengths and lengths of exposure. So if you look at the literal definition of radiation, okay, uh, the emission of energy as electromagnetic waves or as moving subatomic particles, which aren't really particles, right? This is just the way that physics describes it so that we can somewhat understand it, especially high energy particles that cause ionization. Okay, uh, in biology, it's divergence out of from a central point, in particular evolution from an ancestral animal or plant group into a variety of new forms. In other words, evolution. So, right, uh, radiation just means, basically means going from a central point outwards. Okay, that's really what uh, radiation is, just movement. Okay, so what is radioactivity? And this right here is how we've always learned it, right? In science class, you guys learn this stuff right now, you know, particles and neutrons and electrons. No, not yet? Okay, well, who in here did learn that, right? You all learned electrons, and you remember that the electrons are the little ones that go around the outside, right? But the reality is, again, electrons are not little particles that are moving around the outside of an atom. They're actually energy fields. They're, theoretically, there isn't really an electron. It's an electron shield. It's, it's, it's just basically an energy state around the other energy state in the middle. You know, it's a negative charge around the positive charge. So, uh, so this makes it really confusing trying to understand it 
because this really isn't how it works. But radioactivity refers to the particles which are emitted from nuclei as a result of nuclear instability. Because the nucleus experiences the intense conflict between the two strongest forces in nature, it should not be surprising that there are many nuclear isotopes which are unstable and emit some kind of radiation. So basically, it's, it's an unstable, uh, a radioactive component is an unstable charge uh, material. It's, it's something that doesn't have a balanced electrical state. Okay, so it's losing positive, it's losing negative, and there is a ton of energy. I mean, just an, an extreme amount of energy that holds material together. Uh, so, of course, when you rip it apart, it releases all that energy, otherwise known as nuclear reactions, right? And you all have seen what a nuclear bomb can do. Okay, so, you know, that hopefully just kind of gets you at least thinking in the right framework as we start talking about radiation and all these different things, understanding, just really trying to keep that sunk in your brain that, that you know, that, that these aren't really particles and it's energy we're talking about and, and you, you'll be better be able to understand how outside energy now reacts with what we call the DNA of ours and does DNA damage because that energy is really breaking up the energy patterns that hold our body and glue it together, right? It's, it's just, it's putting a charge into our already electrical state, understand? Which is really cool thinking about the nervous system because of course the nervous system, its operation is electrical. You know, that, that's how it's energetic. That's how the whole thing works. Okay? So from this point forward, uh, Amber is actually going to be coming up and she's going to be teaching the rest of this workshop, going through all the fun stuff on smart meters and cell phones and all that. For all those of you that don't know anybody watching this on YouTube, uh, Amber has been a long-term uh, patient. She's worked for us for uh, four years. Four years. Four years, so she's been here a while. So she she's been through many many workshops and everything, but uh, she's never taught one. And so we were deciding on what the uh, what the event was going to be, what the subject was going to be, and and you know I, I was obviously able to get her to teach it. So party on, guys! Enjoy the rest of it. And uh, I, I have just one slide left at the end, but she's going to take it from here. Good job. All right. So we're going to talk a lot about radiation, of course, but. A lot of this stemmed off of just how powerful technology is becoming in our lives. So we're seeing more and more of it, especially at, over the last 20 years. It's You see people on cell phones right here. <laughs> so kids on them already. It's just part of what we are now. And it shouldn't be stopped, but we should look into the dangers of it and be aware of what it's doing to our bodies because we can't see radioactivity but it is there and it is harmful. So, two types of radiation. Everything that emits radiation is either ionizing or non-ionizing. Ionizing radiation carries energy at high speeds. Sources include lightning, supernova, explosions, this here, x-rays, and then you have non-ionizing radiation carries energy at lower speeds and sources include the sun, ultraviolet rays, visible light, infrared, microwave, lasers, power lines, and etc. So, types of exposure from radiation. You have alpha, beta, gamma, and X, just your third. So, alpha is not able to penetrate through clothing and travels short distances, a few inches through the air. Beta moderately penetrating through the skin and travels several feet in the air, penetrating to germinal layer of skin where new skin cells are produced and can cause skin injury. That's where you get to, you know, sunburns, things like that. And then gamma and X are high penetrating through electromagnetic energy. So your natural radiation, the earth emits almost all types of radiation. We ourselves are even radiating. However, mostly infrared, non-ionizing, radio waves, and visible light. Earth's radiation from the ground heats up and re-emits energy as long wave radiation in the forms of infrared rays, 
Those electrons coming from the ground are important for our health and are why we should walk barefoot outside when possible to improve our health. Studies show it can remove toxins, relieve stress, improve blood oxygenation and circulation, and improve our immune response. So that is so healthy to be getting our vitamin D outside, get barefoot, get a swimsuit on, and be breathing fresh air. So it doesn't really get better than that. And exercise outside. The sun emits all of the different kinds of radiation, beta and gamma radiation, 99% being rays in the form of visible light, ultraviolet rays, which vitamin D, and infrared rays. So UV rays, your vitamin D, actually the sun hits your skin, which makes it then go to the liver and that's where it's produced. So it's just not just hitting your skin and turning to hormone D, it's actually having to go through a gut process in the liver. All right, man-made radiation. So this is where, you know, you have the good and bad radiation. God, the radiation that he made in the earth, it's good for us, the sun and all that, but man-made radiation is where we get a little bit dangerous. So television, tobacco has lead and polonium that emits radiation. So that's scary. Another reason to stop smoking. Medical x-rays, smoke detectors, ionization chamber detectors. Those are the smoke detectors that are the cheapest on the market and what most of us do have in our homes. So definitely want to check your smoke detectors, see if they are those kind, and then might want to upgrade to a little bit of a pricier one just so you're getting that extra radiation help. Lantern mantles, nuclear medicine scans, which they do a lot of those on the brain, power lines, electrical outlets, handheld devices, smart meters, which we're going to get into that later, microwave ovens. Micro sieverts exposure. So a sievert is a unit of radiation dose. So we're going to go through several different sievert units to see what exposure you're getting from different things. So this is really cool. Levels based on external radiation, micro sieverts per hour. So this is just external, not internal. 10 sieverts is the average radiation you receive daily. So that's just walking about daily. 20 sieverts radiation from a standard chest x-ray. So here in the office, we standardly do four x-rays a year on patients just to make sure we know exactly what's going on with your spine. So those four x-rays, you'll see in a second when it comes to getting a mammogram, the difference between those and how people are thinking one mammogram isn't that big of a deal, but they're like, oh, four x-rays, that's, that's four of them, you know. So, 40 sieverts radiation you receive taking a flight from New York to LA. That is the plane. Be interesting. Plus those uh, scanners that they have that you walk through so they don't have to pat you down. You definitely want to skip that and have them just pat you down because the radiation you receive from those machines is a lot. And let's see. 100 sieverts radiation you receive during a dental x-ray. So that's just that x-ray around your head, which is crazy, that's 100. 3,000 sieverts radiation dose from a mammogram. So that equals 150 chest x-rays. So that's like us taking to the x-ray room and hitting it 150 times. That equals a mammogram, and they say how important that is for women to do, and you see what radiation dose comes from that. 50,000 sieverts, maximum allowed radiation dose yearly for U.S. citizens. Now that dose goes up every time the government thinks it needs to. So anytime we have a natural disaster, they're going to say, ah, well, we, we just are going to raise that so that everybody will feel comfortable and won't cause a place and make us have to explain anything. So that goes up. One hundred thousand sieverts, lowest yearly dose likely linked to cancer, and then two million sieverts, severe radiation poisoning, and sometimes fatal. Effects on the environment. So radiation, our tablets, everything that is affecting the environment, and this is one of the most interesting topics that I found on 
the effects on the environment. So the 2011 earthquake in Japan, who remembers Fukushima? Yes. So that was a pretty huge deal that we quickly moved on to, you know, whatever else they wanted to push in the news just to make us kind of forget about it. So the 2011 earthquake in Japan caused a 15 meter, that's 45 foot tsunami and disabled three Fukushima da Daiichi reactors causing meltdown. After that meltdown, ambient levels of radiation in Washington state went up 40,000 times above normal average. I think that was like four days after it happened, but it's crazy. And it had to cross the Pacific Ocean. Yes, right exactly. In 2014, every day that was documented, there was 400 tons of highly radioactive water pouring into the Pacific headed towards the U.S. Because it affects the fish, it affects us as well. Not so surprising, of course the U.S. does not test our water, the fish, or the air for that radiation. The people in Japan are at ground zero, so are affected every day. And they're not, there's, you know, families living 20 miles away from Fukushima, and they're telling them, you're fine, you know, no worries. There is a massive cover-up of how much radioactive material is actually leaking into our ocean. So this is just a map of from three days, six days, ten days, and you can see it just spreading that entire way over the Pacific, all the way to, let's see, that's California, Washington State there. So that's, that's scary. And of course, I mean, it's not really dying now, that's still there. So now we are going to talk about very important kids and their electronics. So, this is how you <laughs> Okay. <coughs> Children and radiation. Children are 20 times more sensitive to radiation and should be limited in their use of handheld devices until the age of 12. How old are you? 10. Yes. <laughs> Due to their developing brains, especially between birth and age of 2. Infants' brains triple in size, and so should practice extreme caution when using cell phones. So I see this a lot with um, new parents. They'll come in here or just at the store or anything, shopping around with kids, and they'll place their cell phone on the baby's little car seat, you know, just right on top of the baby's lap. And if you think about all the radiation that's coming out of, especially the newer cell phones, that have all this Wi-Fi and that technology, it's definitely affecting the baby. So just be mindful of that with your kids, keep the cell phones, tablets away, especially from your newborns. Our brains continue in a state of rapid development up until 21 years of age. So understanding that an absence for alcohol, maybe we should be more cautious, maybe we would be more cautious with our kids if a luminous green mist was emitted from our devices. So if we could see it, we might be a little bit more careful about that. Exposure to cell phones and Wi-Fi has been shown to cause diminished reaction time, break, decreased brain motor function, social and emotional problems, and inability to focus on long-term tasks in children as well as many other dysfunctions. I see this a lot when my nieces are trying to study for schoolwork. You know, it can be distracting, but they, they love it so much. But it, it definitely is causing the brain to not be totally there. Exposures associated with greater harm to children are Wi-Fi routers, the wireless baby monitors. So you want to get the baby monitors that actually plug in, and there's less hacking with that too. They show a lot of those new wireless baby monitors. People, pedophiles, can hack into them. And yeah, it's not good. Um, Bluetooth devices, smart boards, smart meters, cordless phones, and other wireless devices. Sorry, nieces, for picking on you so much. <laughs> All right, my favorite topic of the night is going to be on smart meters. So everyone that knows me pretty well knows that I have a pretty good passion for the subject. So um, a couple, uh, I guess about four years ago, 
I learned that we <laughs> I learned that we had a smart meter installed in our home. And one of the biggest things is, well, I heard it on the news, but I started paying more attention to it because I had recently started to have a lot of migraine issues and thought, well, maybe something's there because there was health issues with into that. So, who knows what smart meter is? Okay. Your smart meter is the meter outside of your home that reads how much energy your home is using. So we used to have digital analog meters that were on outside of our home, and now they switched them to the smart meters. So they are reading all of the electricity used on the home, gas, all that. With that, from the digital analog meter to wireless smart meters, smart meters expose you to pulsed digital microwave radiation 24-7. So they never turn off. These things are constantly collecting data on your home and sending those pulse radiation 24-7, which is not good for anyone's health. It emits 160 times more radiation than cell phones. These meters are often installed without permission and sometimes even against the wishes of homeowners. The power company uses these smart meters to collect data on your home as to peak use times. So if you turn on your hair dryer and you're drying your hair, they know how much power that uses and they know exactly what you're using or something that could be similar to that. So it's a very controlling device. And I mean, again, we choose our cell phones. We choose what technology we want in our lives. And this is something that there was no letter sent to houses about it being installed. They did it without people's permission. And people who did know better, there's been a lot of anguish with trying to get it removed. <clears throat> so smart meters are, smart meter installation is part of the Agenda 21 action plan. So if you are not familiar with Agenda 21, please do your research on them. They are a UN group. They, um, this is just part of their process to be doing a controlling thing for the world. <laughs> So definitely look into them. It's very interesting when it comes to their rewilding plan and what they plan to do with the elderly and children. It's very interesting. The meters have caused many symptoms, including headaches, vertigo, lack of energy, and nausea, just to name a few. Parts of Europe have already banned the smart meters, while U.S. citizens have been arrested for not allowing the meters. Some, some have been successful in getting an analog meter put back on their house at their own expense through the power company's permission. So you have to have the permission of the power company. We talked to ours a little bit about it for here in Alabama and didn't get really anywhere about it. It didn't look like it was going to happen, even if we pushed really hard for it. So uh, you can actually look up videos on YouTube of people getting arrested for just standing in front of their home saying, you're not going to put this on my house and they're getting arrested and cops are coming and it's crazy you know it's our homes we should be able to have that right where where are they put? like how do you know if you have a smart meter installed for your home we, if you live um in a home you should be able to find the just meter outside of your house so how can i better explain that um, if you live in Alabama, you got one. Yeah, if you live in Alabama, you got one. Yeah, she's asking like power how. comes in from the power pole. Yeah. That's uh, where it's attached to your house. Yeah. It okay. used to have a spinning wheel on it, and now it's all digital. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Great. Yes. And, and you want to make sure if you have children, they're not in that room. Like Amber happens to have her bed. It used to be right on the wall. Yes. So. No wonder you get migraines. Yeah, we didn't have another bedroom to put her in, so we just moved her bed to the other yeah. wall, and that's helped so, some. So, definitely find out where yours is, just so you can, either if you have children in there, it's going to be important to get them out of that room. Especially and, babies. Yeah, especially babies. And if you do have your bedroom in there, like I do, I took my bed to the other side of the room, and it did <laughs> So, there are ways to shield a smart meter. So, installing an RF, RF radio frequency shield, there's two ways to shield with that. You can either use an absorbent shield or a reflector shield. So you can look up more about that on the internet. It's 
pretty simple to do. Um, they're not that costly, and it's just knowing what kind um, of positioning to put it in to be able to block it from that radiation getting you. They also make EMF, electromagnetic field shielding paint. So strongly suggest to test shielding with a handheld RF radio frequency meter before and after shielding attempts just to make sure that you are doing it the right way and it's effective. So blocking. Just a quick question. This may be an unfair question, but uh, um, RF meter, where would you get that? Amazon has them. They're not cheap. They are about 130 per Yeah, 130, kind of, 160. Do they about here, the smart meter's functionality or how it reads everything? No, it's just it's reading the radiation. It's just, you know, it's it's just to check to see if yeah. the thing that you got to block the radiation is just to see if it's working. I'm pretty sure you can get them cheaper than that. I know I didn't pay that much. For okay. <laughs> this was just one I read that was I mean, suggested. One, yeah, but. I don't think I paid more than ten or fifteen bucks for mine. Ooh, really? Yeah. I will. Just a little cheap plastic one. You're gonna have to post the link up here when you put yeah. this on your tent. <laughs> does it does the shield impair the impede the okay. progress of the, um, the meter? What it's supposed to do? There are people who have put aluminum foil over their smart meters. You can't do that because then that's blocking the signal from actually reaching the power plant. So they will come to your house and you know, take that off. It's the the one we're looking into. We haven't done it yet. It's like a like a little cage that just goes on the side of it. Wire a little cage so it doesn't block. <coughs> it, if anything blocks the power company from getting their reading, you're gonna get in trouble. But this you can look on Amazon and uh, you know that look at the reviews and they'll tell you. So, right. So yeah. when you are shielding it, it's the back of the smart meter and your wall. So it's not the front of the meter that's sending out the signal outside to the power company. It's your wall, your house, your room. All right, so blocking and limiting exposure. This is for laptops and handheld devices, computers too also. So unplug and use on battery lowers the exposure of EMS. So if you have your laptop about to go dead or your cell phone about to go dead and you're still wanting to play with it, it you're going to get a lot more radiation that way. If it's plugged in, the, it becomes, you know, sourcing out. So sit at least three feet from screens, but not too far that it causes eye strain, but three feet's going to really limit that exposure. Buy the right kind of modem router. There's one that um, is pretty good. It's called the TP-Link wireless N300 and you can set timers on these routers to turn off at night that helps a lot of people be able to sleep better also you're not <coughs> affecting your cells when because your body's detoxing while you sleep it's doing a lot of things while you sleep so if you're having that Wi-Fi constantly on 24 7 and while you're sleeping you know that's a good time to get it off cactus plants have the ability to absorb EMF so you can have those plants of course, that'll reach for children, but around your computer area, and that'll help absorb from that. It's really cool. Also, crystal salt lamps. Now, I don't know how much both of those absorb, but, you know, any little bit helps. Take regular breaks. Every 20 minutes is best to get up from it. Take a little bit of a walk. Go fully wired as much as you poss possibly can. So that's with a mouse. If it can be wired, get a wired mouse. Also, keyboards, you want them to be wired every, if they radiate too. And so anything that you can wire. Airplane mode when not in use. So if you're charging your phone, if you put it on the airplane mode, not only does that help it be able to charge twice as fast, but that's going to turn it off from the Wi-Fi and that radiation being a lot more powerful there. Now, doing this does not turn off the device's electromagnetic field from the battery but you are getting the Wi-Fi to stop searching. So I used to think that airplane mode turned off all the Wi-Fi, and I used to sleep with mine beside my bed, but I've learned it better now. So, <laughs> Do not have cell phones in your bedroom, and use plugged power clocks, or battery-operated, of course. So that's going to be a lot better to get 
get out of your room. I've done that for the past week and I definitely have noticed a difference. In Anti radiation air tube headphones. So these are really neat. They, your headphones that are wired, if you're wearing them, they are sending EMFs up to your ears and, and you know, with exposed radiation like that and cell phone use that can cause ear tumors. They have showed different things like that brain tumors, breast cancer, if you're keeping your cell phone in your bra, and things like that. So you want to be careful even with your headphones. So these. Air tube headphones, they reduce the EMFs up to 98%. They're a little bit more expensive, of course, but I think definitely worth it if you do a lot of headphone use. So there are two different types of shields for phones that I really like in my mom. Really like, so yeah, pull that out because I meant to have it. So they make Pong and a Defender Shield case. A Defender Shield goes all the way around the phone. So if you do put it up to your head, you're not getting any radiation. But once you do open a Defender Shield, you are then getting the radiation. So the cool thing about palm cases, you see these, um, I think that's where the antenna, the antenna is coming out of this part here. So if you get a call and you start talking on it, the radiation's coming out from here and knocking the next person in the face. <laughs> so that's... <laughs> It diffuses. It. It diffuses I called him and talked to him. I said, I said, is it getting on my hand? Is it getting on the person that's in front of me? He said, no, it's not the way it works. It's diffusing it. it. Okay. That only uh, blocks like that only blocks like sixty-eight uh, percent. The Defender Shields block a hundred percent. But I had ordered one and I sent it back because who uses their phone up to their ear that much anymore? You know, uh, ours is always open. So I got so I called him. I said. If I'm not going to use it to my ear, he said, if you're, this particular guy from Defender Shield said, if you're holding your devices away from you, like a foot away, that he wouldn't even recommend you buy his from, because it was mostly for touch, touching, holding it up to your ear. So if you do hold it to your ear a lot, and you want 100% protection, then that Defender Shield would do that, because you can close it and still talk. Also, text instead of actually making a phone call, so if you don't need to have a long conversation with somebody, texting is the best way to go because that's just one message sent through compared to having to hold it up to your head. All right, reducing effects naturally of radiation. So in the Fukushima disaster, they actually took some of those victims and were giving them iodine supplements. And so with that, when they tested them, after they had been taking it a while, their radiation effects were a lot lower. So that's really cool. And iodine is uh, something we all should be taking anyways, and that's just another reason why. So potassium, calcium, and magnesium, I'm trying to say this right, dimethyl sulfoxide, DMSO, zeolite clay, bentonite clay, activated charcoal, the pain, bee pollen, beets, cold pressed vegetable oil, or organic brewer's yeast, and antioxidants. So those are all going to help get some of that knocked out of your body and help with those cells. So this is where Dr. Mike comes in. Okay. Yes. <laughs> Very good. Okay, so uh, yeah, great job. Lots of information, obviously a lot to, to go home and look into. Um, you know, th this last slide, it really I just want to cover a couple of points that we don't always think about, but goes hand in hand with uh, the, the topic of conversation in the book. Um, number one being full sun without sunburn. Um, you know, especially this time of year, this is when everybody's starting to get outside. Uh, so we start seeing a lot of patients coming in sunburn, um, you know, and uh, earlier on today, you know, I, I, I uh, was talking to a patient over at Red Bar and he obviously was very sunburned and I said, so you got, you got fried, huh? And he said, yeah, but, um, you know, I guess it's like I'm still trying to figure out if, um, you know, if the, if, if the sunburn is worse or if the sunblock is worse. Oh. 
And I, and I said, and I made the point, I said, well, that's kind of like asking, is it, you know, is being complete flat out drunk worse or never having a drink in your life? You know, I mean, it's the, and so in other words, I guess the, the idea for most people would be in the middle. It's, you know, moderation. Like that's, that's usually the best, the best uh, option to just kind of avoid both ends. Um, so the full sun without sunburn, I mean, you want to get sun, but you've got to work into it. You can't just go from winter mode to going out and spending eight hours on the beach. You know, the